Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Anahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihil kareem amma ba'd. Today uh, we are going to talk about uh, one of the great scholar. Um, he is quite uh, popular for his tafsir that he wrote, which is called Tafsir al-Kabir, the biggest, the great commentary. So his name is uh, Fakhruddin Razi, known as a known like Fakhruddin Razi, even though the word Razi, um, his own um, uh, his own lecturer, his own uh, teacher's name also Razi, he is uh, Abu Bakr Muhammad Zakaria Razi, also known for many, uh, many, many subjects, including philosophy. But this one that here we are talking about, Fakhruddin Razi, you could say the famous Razi, so the one who who, who who took the best out of the other Razi. All right, so here we are talking about um, Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Umar ibn al Hussein al Taimi al Bakri al Tabristani Fakhruddin Razi. So Fakhruddin Razi was born in were born to a family of Arab immigrants uh, from the tribe of Quraysh. You know, he is a Quraishi, and who migrated uh, to the modern day of Iran. He went to, they went to the place of Ray uh, in the province of Mazandaran, which actually today is in Iran. Um, so this Imam Fakhruddin Razi, he is actually, um, People call him, the scholars call him a Sultan of Theologians. Um, he was a, he was a polymath, like I told you last time, many scholars were polymaths. Uh, they were experts, exp they were experts in so many fields, including this Imam Fakhruddin Razi, used to be very good in medicine, chemistry, most importantly, physics and metaphysics. Uh, this is what's surprising me when I look into his work. Um, it's a different world that, you know, he is taking us, which is beyond this physical world. Um, he talks about astronomy, he talks about cosmology, he wrote something on literature, and of course, uh, theology, he is a sultan of theology. He also talks about the ontology and then history he also talks about the jurisprudence um scholars named him as a sheikh al islam um some of them even uh, called them, call him as a as a hujjat al islam yeah so uh, so this uh, this 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 scholar is actually um quite famous for his tafsir, like I told you earlier. Um, but very much his work is actually very much into, uh, you know, the physics and metaphysics, especially when it comes to, when it comes to the, um, the, the universe and the multiverse. So I think, I think uh, this is the first scholar who actually, Islamic scholar who talks about this, the concept of, multi who came with the concept of multiverse because because initially earlier than that uh, if you look uh, history then the people only talk about the aristotelian notion the aristotle he said that there is a single universe revolving around a single world so this is something if you if you came across but Razi is the one who actually argued uh, the existence of, uh, you know, the outer space. He said there, there is not one single universe, there are multiverse. So today what we call it, not one galaxy, there are so many galaxies, the Milky Way, right? So the, today the science is actually proving that there are multi words. There, the, the, today we 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 came we came to know there is not one single sun. There are so many suns. 
but it was quite hard, you know, thousand years ago to talk about it because there is no equipments like today we have. So these are the things uh, he's quite famous for this Imam Raj. He is actually a, he himself is a huge, you know, it's like an encyclopedia. He talks about many things. Let me tell you this. Usually the scholars, uh, they say this. They say Tafsir al-Kabir, when they talk about his, uh, his, his, his great work, which is actually Tafsir al-Kabir, they say this, they say, um, Tafsir al-Kabir has everything in it except the Tafsir. <laughs> Do you understand my point? It, it has everything except the Tafsir, which means the scholars trying to say that this tafsir is actually totally different from other tafsir because it is not following the same methodology like the mufassirin. You know, everybody they have their own methodology. Most of the scholars in uh, a discipline will follow more or less is the same methodology. So mufassirin they have their own methodology. You know, talking about uh, the Quranic verses and then the sabab nuzul and then you know they talk about the related hadith and then the athar, the, the the companions, you know, some of the other scholars' reputations and their interpretations. But Tafsir al-Kabir, it is totally different if you look, because it first of all is a huge volume, multi-volumes Tafsir, and then you, if you start reading, you know, if you, even you talk about, if you want to read about Surah Al-Fatiha, you know, he talks about Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Then he gives more explanation on the word Al Alameen. So this this is where actually he comes up with the idea of multiverse. Al Alam. It, it is in the first verse of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alam is actually a universe. Alameen is the plural of universes. So it is actually multiverses. So. So it is beyond our capability of knowing. So the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, al alamin So Allah is actually the rub of the whole entire multiverses. So he talks about, you know, in scientific manner, in philosophical manner, he go beyond the, the normal and uh, typical explanation of tafsir. That's why they said that it has everything other than tafsir. But most of the cases also, uh, scholars, they agreed that, you know, uh, most of his work, especially Imam, um, most of uh, Imam Fakhruddin Razi's work has been not been explored. So it is there for students like us, you know, we should go back and look into that. Um, there, there is a famous work, uh, also the book entitled, you know, uh, he talks about the Eastern studies in metaphysics and physics. Mabahis al Mashriqiya, fi ilm al Ilahiya, wat Tabi'iya. So, ilm al Ilahiya, whereby he talks about metaphysics, and Tabi'iya, he talks about physics. So, there is a combination that he talks about. Uh, that's something amazing. Um, he also, uh, you know, uh, developed uh, the, the, the discipline of Kalam. He is also a Sufi, also, he's also an Islamic scholastic theology, right, from Ashari, Ashariya, and uh, most probably, um, you know, he talks about when it, when it comes to, for example, you know, uh, he, brings, he brings this uh, term called uh, Mumkinat. So this mumkinat, like, like this mumkinat is actually something that, that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, which is actually not visible to us. Uh, this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stays, for example, you know, he is there, whether it is a arsh or kursi, a samawat, you know, ard shams. So these are so many terms available in Quranic verses. He uses that and then he described that actually it is this this um, there is a multiple worlds within this single universe and cosmos so in a way you can say that there are so many dimensions of life not necessarily what we see is what we see there is something different because our eyes 
cannot catch everything right we agree that right so there is a capability of my 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 senses so so what to what level i can smell something to what level i can see something to what level i can touch something I can feel warm or cold only to the extended level, not 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 beyond that. So these are the cases, uh, you know. So we are limited. We've been limited to. We are restri we've been restricted. So which means that whatever that we don't know doesn't mean that it's not there. So maybe I don't know, but it is there. Whether whether the um, the um, whether the space is expanding yes it is expanding but my knowledge still is expanding it is not actually limit it is actually limited i didn't know everything i don't know everything that's why allah is the rub and we are the slave yeah anyway so he has so many other works as well he talks about uh, he has this um, you know books it is called uh, Asas al taqdis the functions, the foundations of declaring Allah's transcendence. He talks about the Ajaib al Quran. There is a book, uh, he talks about the mysteries of the Quran. There is a book uh, whereby he talks about science of ethics. And uh, also, there is a book he talks about, you know, book on Firasa. This is something, um, something amazing because I remember a few years back someone actually did phd thesis on this particular book kitab al firasa firasa means um, physiognomy if you know physiognomy physiognomy is actually something that you know um uh, how to call it um okay by looking at you they actually can read your face it's like reading your face and also it is a kind of um, anthropological study you know from where you came from what is your origin you know like 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 the background check also also th th there is a study can find out uh, by looking at you whether you are a good person or you are short tempered you know these are the things it's a physiognomy I remember still that I was reading that thesis uh, many years ago. I saw that uh, you know he was actually he actually brought this uh, uh, concept of you know people might be looking similar to some animals. For example, some people look like people look like eagles. Some people look like uh, goats. Yeah. Some people look like bulls. So, so these are the things like they, they, he's trying to get the shape of the face and then the similarity within the animal and then trying to combine the strength of the animal and the strength of the human. So this is something, this is something, you know, uh, what we call it, firasa. So he has a book on it. He also talked about Mantik, he has a book on Mantik, he has... Um, so there are so many works anyway. So now coming back to uh, our subject. So this is what uh, we wanted to know, right? Um, so these are the scholars, philosophy. Uh, he was influenced by uh, Muhammad ibn Zakari al-Razi, as I told you, Razi, another Razi. Also Farabi ibn Sina, Imam al-Ghazali, those are the predecessors for him and um, the, the 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 these are the major work like I told you just now so many uh, many many scholars they think uh, in, in, including uh, Siddiqui reflects that you know he says um, his work has been not been uh, exposed yet yeah um, but there are many works done in philosophy and science and uh, and when we wanted to look for the economic aspect and uh, and there are very few scholars only talk about his economic aspect so this is what he said yusufuddin finds his discussion to be rational analytical 
and uh, the number of scholar work scholarly was completed by this great scholar live up to Razi's standard and reputation according to Ibn Abi Usaiba the number of standard 68 someone say 93 great and small works available so among the work today we are going to talk about one particular work there is a book um, if you even read the book, if you just read the title of the book, you 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 have no clue. Uh, so look at the book name. Among the book completed, this is the book we are going to talk about today. Kitab and Nafs wa Ruh wa Sharah wahuma. So, so if you know a little Arabic, I think you will understand the name is actually Kitab and Nafs. You know the Nafs and then the Ruh, the Soul. Washarah Kuwahuma Kuwa is actually the food, the way of feeding. <clears throat> so now the, the, the this book is going to talk about feeding or strengthening the nafs and ruh. So you might be asking how this strengthening strengthening uh, nafs and ruh is actually something to talk about economic aspect. Actually, this is the challenge today to talk about is economic aspect. So this is the book name. Book of Soul and Spirit. And an exposition of their faculties. So this is nice translation because uh, this book is actually has been translated into English. Uh, I have given you I have given the references to you in, in your course outline if you can look back. So this is very nice translation. Washarah Wahuma, they said, uh, an exposition of their faculties. Okay. So his prominent features on his writing is that he concentrated on the purification of soul and achievement of high ideals. In fact, this kitab is closely related to the question of akhlaq and ethics. So this book has uh, divided into two parts. The first part is actually um, talks about general principle of ethics, general principle of ethics, encompassing 12th chapter, while the second uh, part of 10 chapters deals with the issue of uh, what concerns appetition, appetition, so appetite. So what are the appetite that can be given to this uh, ruh and uh, spirit, I mean the soul and the spirit. So now what, uh, when we look at the book, Mm. we found that you know um, he, he put it very quite interestingly so in a way you can uh, see that it is the continuation of Imam al-Ghazali so Imam al-Ghazali actually you know uh, you remember he talks about um, the seven activities the economic activities that you know a Muslim should have so he talks about how do you um, uh, how 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 do, how how do you keep the keep your relationship with economic activities at the same time you also keep your relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So he talks about the balancing this relationship, right? So so this uh, work uh, from as I told you, Fakhruddin Razi also has been influenced by Al Ghazali. Right, because uh, Al Ghazali is also from Persia, and also you know this is also from, I mean uh, this um, scholar Fakhruddin also uh, Fakhruddin Razi also is an Arab, but he lived in, he's a Persian, Arab Persian, yeah. So, so we saw that connection actually. Uh, he greatly influenced by um, Imam Al Ghazali, so that actually he talks about wealth. So even though the book actually giving you uh, an exposure on how do you feed, how do you strengthen your soul and spirit, but actually it gives you more into how do you, how do you control it, you know, how do you nurture it, how do you handle your nafs and the ruh. So you, basically speaking, he talks about the spirit, the soul and your body. And how do you keep that uh, in a rightful path so that you don't deviate from this 
from this dunyavi, from this worldly material stuff. So this is something amazing. So we're gonna talk about around uh, 10 to 11 points. Yeah, uh, we will be talking about what he talks about. Uh, wealth and spending the wealth, especially the, 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 the way of spending. Um, he talks about, you know, um, what is the right way of spending? How do you restrict yourself in spending? How do you restrict yourself in earning? So basically, it is the cusp. Um, I, I, think, I think I told you earlier, even the first book was written by uh, Imam uh, Shaibani, it actually was Kitab al-Kasb, the way of earning. So if you look into that way, so maybe this is the continuation of uh, Imam al Imam Shaibani, Kitab al-Kasb, and also later Imam al-Ghazali, now we have Imam Razi. So he wants to describe in his first, uh, this is the first point that he wants to describe, what is the position of Islam in spending of wealth? Yeah, he sees that spending of wealth can be seen in two perspectives. First of all, Islam enjoins the seeking and spending of wealth. And second, Islam describes wealth as a distraction and a test. So, so this is a challenge. Because we see that uh, Allah say, Kulu washrabu, Allah say, eat whatever you want, drink whatever you want. Then Allah say, Wala tusrifu, do not waste it. So Allah says, uh, once you finish your Jum'ah prayer, Fantashiru uh, fil arli wa min fadlillah. He says that go back. Uh, spread on the world, spread in the earth of Allah, and then go and find your find your sustenance. Allah says this, go, this is your world. You Allah even says that everything is given. Meaning to say that He has given you the control because there is no single creature, there is no single animal or creature that actually controlling human being you cannot see that every small or big animals is actually is actually controlled by human being whether it is a whale or elephant or whether it is a small insect humans are controlling them it's not the other way around they are not controlling humans so whether it is a movable or immovable whether it is a, a livable or non-livable you can see that living and non-living everything is controlled by human being whether it is the trees or mountains or oceans everything so meaning to say that allah says i have given you everything it is in your way you can actually control it you can do whatever you want but on the other side on the other side if you look quran and hadith you will see so many warning saying that okay al malu wal banuna zinatul hayatid dunya these properties, wealth, and also these uh, children and everything that Allah has given you is a test. Fitna. Allah says use the word fitna. Al malu al banuna fitna. It's a fitna. Fitna means what? It's a test. Allah wants to see whether whether you 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 keep it, whether you handle it, whether you manage it, or whether you you forget the purpose of it. In another hadith, Qudusi, Allah says that, you know, Allah says, uh, O Banu Adam, o, o, o son of Adam, we have created everything for you. We have created everything. The entire universe we have created for you, but we have created you for me. Allah says, Allah says this, we have created you for me, meaning to say that to pray him. So our purpose of creation is actually Allah says this in Quran the reason that Allah created humans and human and jinns the reason he created is actually to worship him to know him so that is the purpose of creation so now if you look if you look this world is given to us as a test so that actually Allah wants to see how much uh, we play 
justice how much actually we uh, we, we 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 put ourselves in control how much we actually follow the rules how much we actually make sure we don't we don't we don't we don't we don't rob somebody we don't cheat someone we don't take we don't use haram uh, i mean we don't use haram we don't consume uh, haram uh, products we don't consume we don't even sell trade haram products we don't buy we don't buy halal products but by using the haram money we don't do that so this is all actually allah wants to see that's why one place it is enjoins the seeking and spending of wealth the other side described wealth as a distraction and the test so now to resolve this razi wrote if wealth is spent in the acquisition of sciences and excellent manners it is price worthy and if it is spent for sensuous pleasures which have been known as condemnable it is condemnable so he says that okay you have money and you really want to spend it so put it in this way you spend it not for you not for your own pleasure spend it for the well-being of the people you 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 really have one million ringgit right you have given a million ringgit what you will do that's a simple question imam razi wants to ask you so if i have given you one million ringgit what will you do so someone will come and say sir if you give me one million i will try to buy some good car i will buy maybe ferrari i don't know whether it cost one million or more than one million i don't know i will buy a big bungalow i will buy you know big phones and uh, tvs and you know maybe uh, maybe i will buy a most expensive shoes most expensive food so this is one way of doing right in a way it is also halal for you to do but remember it is a test allah has given you that money it is a test so the other people if, if if i give you again one million ringgit and i say okay what do you want to do if someone comes and say sir i want to use this one million ringgit in a business someone come and say yeah, the reason that i want to put in a business so that i'm actually of course i'm i'm going to earn the money but my purpose also helping i mean creating jobs creating wealth so i became the enterprise so i create more entrepreneurs so i give the opportunity for the young graduates to come and start their own startup and then so that you know i'm moving something i'm creating a kind of you know attraction to everybody so that everybody will come and they do something they work hard and then they get something so they produce something and then they package and then they deliver or they can sell something or they can actually learn something experts we through the training we create expertise and then we train the trainers and then through these trainings you know we offer some services and then the, through the services it is actually i am making something moving around so it is for the purpose of science not for the purpose of my own pleasure so this is something that what actually uh, you know imam razi is actually suggesting this is another way also you know i give you 1 million ringgit you can actually just you know give that 1 million ringgit as a sadaqa to somebody right you don't even touch that money i give you 1 million you just immediately transfer that 1 million ringgit to the zakat unit or to sadaqa or to because you don't want to handle it you just say okay i don't want that this is another way of doing but the best way will be the middle way the first one is totally you know putting it everything on you which is actually uh, condemnable it is a condemnable the other one the last the number 3 is actually giving everything to somebody um without thinking of how to use it properly but just giving to somebody as a sadaqa which is also good 
which is actually too good actually but but in number 3 you don't want to take risk but in number 2 is something that you want to take risk and you want to move that money and you want to actually create some jobs and you want to get into some trouble so that actually you know you 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 want to use that money in a way where actually it could be benefit to so many people you see you give money to someone like what i said number 3 right number 3 is actually you give that money to somebody completely what they will do they will use it for maybe 2 days or 3 days maybe you you want them you you gave it to somebody and you want them to um divide and uh, distribute to 100 families for example right so it goes to 100 families let's say you give 1000 ringgit to uh, maybe 1000 family or maybe you give 1000 ringgit to 1000 families or 10000 families so what happens that 1000 ringgit can only stay for one month the next month after they finish 1000 ringgit the next month they will be expecting another donor another philanthropist who can actually who can actually uh, donate 1 1 million again so the things that you see the things continue even though you are sending money for the good cause but the thing is you are not solving the problem you are not solving the problem they become dependent and then they will be looking for another donor to come to sell so but if you look in number 2 which is actually you spend that money you create jobs and then you run it you roll it this is what we call rolling round uh, rolling down you roll it and then you know you create jobs this is what actually imam razi talks about the spending of wealth for the attainment of spiritual bliss you can see here that uh, he created this he has the spending wealth self benefit self benefit is actually food clothing dwelling marriage then you have benefit for others benefit for others there is something specified spending but receiving no gain in return yeah this is one way the another way is spending with hope secure some gains So securing some gains is actually there's a hereafter gains there is also worldly gains so this is how actually he brings this attainment of spiritual bliss number 3 how wealth can be a source of misery yes of course it could it could become the source of misery you know not necessary wealth always a source of uh, betterment it's not necessary the the wealth always should be the source of fortune it could be also source of misfortune or misery when someone is over indulgence meaning over spending when someone become over spending it can cause one's wealth to become scarcer one's remembrance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be decrease and one possibly turn to unlawful earning to replenish one's depleting wealth so this is what actually will happen because of this the wealth can become is fortune yeah because of the overspending wealth it's insatiable demand uh, this is the greedy insatiable is actually greedy wealth is greedy demand and its relationship with one's wants and needs so razi gives two analogy the first one is actually for the greed you know the love of collecting and obtaining wealth is like collecting wealth the other one is uh, of course the same thing goes to miserliness and parsimony miserliness is something like stinginess you keep that you collect and you collect you you love money you keep on collecting and you keep it in your bank you don't use it at all so when you do that there are two possible effect may arise if this insatiable demand affect the level and quantum of one's needs and wants love for wealth can cause the removal of removal of one since to still desire a certain want will have to cause one to part with a portion of one's wealth before that want can be obtained or satisfied the next one is love for substantial wealth reflected by the amount of wealth 
that one would need to satisfy a high level of needs can be decreased by decreasing one's level and number of ones. So here he talks about, uh, you know, this is the two deep, you know, philosophical, uh, some philosophy, philosophical aspect of spending, spending too much or keeping it too much, you know, whether it is a miserliness or overindulgence. So what happens is that he is trying to tell that, you know, he talks about the wants and needs. Yeah. So what should be the relationship with these two? You know, I want to have something. I want iPhone, but do I need iPhone? That's the question. Yeah. I want Ferrari, but do I need Ferrari? Yeah. I want this, but do I need this? So now I need to, I need to, um, I need to survey myself that <clears throat> will I go with my need or will I go with my wants? So, so usually this is what, this is called parenting as well, yeah? When you become uh, parents, inshallah, you will easily understand this. So when your children keep on asking this, asking that, you know, when you take them to the market, to the shopping mall, you know, every time if you have a small, even you have seen the siblings, right? You have seen your siblings, you know, asking that, I want that, I want this, I want that. So every single time, you know, the children, they want something. So, this is what we call parenting. You know, we say, okay, do you want this or do you need this? So a simple way is if you need it, I'm ready to buy anything for you. If you need it, you need to justify. I mean, you need this, for example, you, I, I need this so that I can use it for my study. I need this so that I can become creative. I need this so that I can work on this so I don't have to watch TV, too much TV. So that I don't have to watch too much games. I don't have to play too much games. So, so if that is what we call it a need, whether it is your um, physical need or maybe your mental need, you know, these are the things are there. But wants is something that if you want to fulfill somebody's wants, uh, believe me, it is impossible because human has unlimited wants because Human is a selfish. <laughs> yeah, he's also altruistic. I, I agree. At the same time, he's also selfish. So do you want do you want the proof? Yes, of course. The Prophet said himself. Prophet said this. Prophet said, if son of Adam given one valley of gold, you know the valley. Let's say the Klang Valley. The Klang Valley is full of gold. All right. So I gave it to you. I gave it to you, the full of gold of Kalang Valley. And then I ask you, do you want, what do you want? You will tell, can I have one more Kalang Valley? <laughs> right. This is what Prophet said. Prophet said this, if a son of Adam given a, a full of gold, a valley of full of gold, and the son of Adam will ask for one more. If you give him the whole world, he said, can I have one more world? And then Prophet said, only. Uh, Prophet said this. Prophet said, only. Only the sand in the grave can fill his desires. Only the sand. Until he goes to, until he goes to the grave. Son of Adam, until he goes to the grave, he will be wanting everything. So this is this is the nature of the human being that he wants everything. So Imam Razi says that, you know, um, if someone is actually trying to decrease the wants, so he is actually doing some calculation. It's like uh, what we do in the uh, studies in economics, usually we we try to see we try to see the variables whereby you know what kind of factors is actually used 
to find the relationship between A and B. Yeah. So let's say a relationship between supply and demand, a relationship between human capital and human wages. So we use that, right? We do that kind of calculation. So he here, Imam Razi is actually trying to do that. He says that, okay, uh, there is a need and there is a wants, but when human tries to reduce his wants, there is a possibility that someone who need something will get his needs fulfilled maybe i can give you some practical example because i i studied this the practical example is actually you know uh, when you are in a market um, especially now for example now yeah now I, I now you know that how market works and uh, you you can if you even go to many uh, supermarket now shopping mall actually you will see many shops already been closed so there are a number of uh, shoppings are open but you can also see that uh, the production has been stopped because uh, you know even in the factories uh, people are not working nowadays uh, or maybe it's been restricted to 30 percentage only because now if you can work only 30 percentage of people because there is no single one there is no single company is actually working as 100 percent because of the uh, mco that we are having today of course it's necessary that we should have this because of the circumstances so now what happens is that there is a lack of uh, you know supply definitely and um, let's say for example they said okay we will, we will be able to only send a particular sugar i mean uh, we can only send uh, particular tons of sugar to the market so you need sugar let's say you need one kilo of sugar for one week it's fine you can go and you buy one kilo of sugar but if every one of us started buying 10 kilo of sugar because not that i need sugar now i want sugar i want the sugar so what happens that when I want, I always buy more. At the same time, sugar is not that expensive. So there is a there is a stand where you can say I need one kilo of sugar, but when it comes to want, I want 10 kilo of sugar. So instead of buying one kilo, you buy 10 kilo. So if every one of us started buying 10 kilo, what exactly will happen this is what imam razi trying to tell he says that if everybody wants 10 kilo of sugar the first 100 people will buy 10 kilo of sugar the people who come after 100 the 101 102 100 so the people who comes after 100 they won't even get their need they won't even get one kilo because they are supposed to get one kilo of sugar. This is just an example. I'm giving you sugar. There are so many. There are so many examples. Actually, you can add uh, whether it is your shoes or your laptop, your 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 pakayan, you know, your transportation. Today, uh, even transportation also a problem because you you book something, you have to wait for six months. You know, you have to wait for six months, and. Uh, so now this is what he said. So when someone is actually fulfilling his wants, it will affect someone's needs. That's what actually happening. And then when someone is actually started hoarding and uh, keeping stuff with him, then definitely, you know, um, it will affect people's need. Theoretical exposition on uh, parsimony uh, or hoarding and overindulgence in ostentatious ones. Al Razi recommended the following. So now he talks about the problems, like earlier in number four, he talks about the problem. At the same time, he also gives the solutions. So this is the beauty of Razi. He says that he gives some recommendations. So what you should do, if you follow the list of actions that one can strive to appreciate in order to decrease 
parsimonious or hoarding inclination because this is a hoarding inclination is actually everybody having it because it happens to everybody i tell you even <coughs> sorry <coughs> even when government said last year that uh, there is going to be mco <laughs> right there is going to be a, a strict mco you know what happened people went to the supermarket and then they started buying everything right you you still remember the news last year you know uh, many countries especially in australia they were uh, running out of toilet papers because toilet papers you know <laughs> there is a need for toilet paper but there is a want everybody bought everything so people who need even one were not able to get it so now this is what happens even in malaysia also when uh, when it, it last year and especially i remember still march april last year i think i remember you go to the shopping mall everything is finished empty people started buying everything even when i was told that i cannot go out for another uh, two months then i also need to buy something for two months i need to keep something so this is what actually he talks about you know how to decrease uh, hoarding inclination he said decrease one's needs or wants so that the amount of wealth that would be needed to satisfy a high level of needs would decline so it is all he says it is all here here or here <laughs> okay it is all here he says that if you can decrease your need so maybe i might say okay i always um, i always have uh, at least five to six shoes you know this shoe for jogging this shoe for running this shoe for some occasion this shoe for some official occasions you know so maybe i can actually reduce my need i say okay it's all right let let me keep at least two at least one you see yeah? this thing is not about he is actually teaching um you know he is actually teaching the adab he is not only that he is uh, teaching um it's not about only the religious perspective it is also the economic perspective because because what happens that uh, when we started buying a lot when we started storing a lot uh, the consumption is actually is not becoming responsible it becomes like you know um we became the human being who actually uh, exploit a lot of resources just just imagine when you are buying a shoe or buying a jacket it actually requires uh, tens and thousands liters of water you know that one jacket one leather jacket if you buy according to a statistic they said 15000 15000 liters of water should be wasted on that jacket just imagine every single product whether it is a synthetic plastic product whether it's a leather product whether it is a cotton product whether it is a you know um uh, hardware or software whatever it is there is something behind it the resources the resource has been used whether it is a paper for example normal paper it, it it comes with the resources of the tree so now if we don't make ourselves responsible consumer uh, if we don't follow the responsible consumption and if the producers uh, if the producers they don't follow the responsible productions what happens that actually we are going to um use all the resources in fact we are going to use the resources that we supposed to leave for the future generation so my son and your daughter and your son your grains uh, grains grandson and granddaughter won't have sufficient resources for them to live so today my today my ostent ostentatious wants my greedy wants can destroy tomorrow my children's need so 
if I can understand what the relationship between this wants and needs, how it's actually affect the current consumer market, I need to also understand how it's going to affect the future market. So if I finished everything, if I spoiled everything and I, if I, um, you see, they, they say that every single day more than uh, hundreds and hundreds of creatures, I mean, the new species are actually, uh, actually been, uh, uh, it's been, it's been destroyed. It's, it's, it's dying itself, it's not coming back. So now we are actually running out of uh, resources, running out of time. And then you can see this is the, the, the result of global warming. This is what happens because of our usages, because of our vehicles that we are using, the petrol, the fossil fuel, and uh, we are creating the gas emissions, and then we are using the plastic that cannot be decomposed, and uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the sea, um, the ocean, the, 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 the pollution in the ocean, the pollution of the air, pollution of the water, and then wasting so many things. This is all actually going to cause, maybe it's not going to happen now, not in our time, but later the, the future generation is going to suffer. So now, that's why when he says this, decrease one's needs or wants so that the amount of wealth that would be needed to satisfy a high level. So now he says the the economic aspect has to start from the nafs. That's why this is how Imam Razi was able to connect nafs and economics. Because uh, economics is what, is what actually, I, I understand that it's 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 a study that actually um, uh, see it, the study actually ex explores the, the 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 human being behavior in 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 decision like for example it, it studies the behavior as a relationship between the given ends and the scars right I understand that but again it is a behavior. If someone, if people, scholars like Razis actually can talk about your behavior, if 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 scholars like Al Ghazali can change your behavior, then I think uh, the outcome can be changed. That's why, that's why the Islamic economic thought is actually not talking about the material world. It starts from nafs and ruh, so that actually you can bring the proper solutions to the the crisis today that we are happening we are we are facing the crisis it can happen any time you know tomorrow the banks are going to uh, lose their jobs and uh, the finance all going to become technology fin fintech so and then the central banks are going to lose their authority because the private sectors are actually grooming i mean growing for example you can see that a country like china is currently um they have alipay you know i think you you have seen this even some other countries also still authorize the alipay i mean i'm not saying this is wrong this is this is in a way it looks good but in, a, in another way the central bank will lose the authority and then because of that the the, the the, the, the regional banks will lose authority and then like everybody will have their own uh, slot slot that you know you can they, they, they everybody actually today want you to keep your money in their bank I mean what I'm talking about is not I'm talking about the um, traditional or so uh, or 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 uh, I'm not talking about the traditional bank. I'm talking about today there are so many new banks. For example, uh, in Malaysia, you don't have it now until Google Pay, I think, yes. You don't have Google Pay, right? But there are big countries like in India, in, in some other places, they have Google Pay, meaning to say that you can keep your money there. Like what we have today, like, for example, we have the touch and go, we can keep the money there. 
we have a settle you know the one we are using for the petronas we can keep our money there uh, for example uh, we have the big uh, like for example erasia they have the money you can keep the money there so this is how it started now company like alipay they have plenty of money and then the facebook the facebook is going to introduce their own currency so you can keep your money there so what will happen that actually the central banks will lose the authority and then the future will be really challenging unless uh, the central bank do something if it if we if it can create its own money then it's fine so what i'm trying to tell is that is this economic system that currently we are having is actually require it require not to say require it is it is actually kind of wajib <laughs> that it has to look into the spiritual aspect and also otherwise you know it will it will die itself it will it will bring to chaos if we don't talk about this now we will never can we will never talk about it we cannot talk about this that's why this issue is very very important if we don't talk about the 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 economic man you only talk about the uh economic substance we don't talk about the economic attributes so we are the attributes we are the human being are the attributes we are the characters of in this in the system and we don't talk about economic man then actually uh, we cannot actually change this also so this kind of uh, you know work that uh, like for example imam razi talks about the futuristic i mean talks about the holistic understanding of economic man so reflect deeply over the teachings of islam remind oneself over the negative image carried by misery enlighten and recommit oneself to the true position remind oneself that over indulgence in wealth can cause nil or non perpetual virtues realize that man must be master over his wealth not vice versa so who should be the master you should be the master not the money that you are earning be aware that miseriness can cause irresponsible utilization of hoarded wealth after one's death realize that universal norms are opposed to miseriness number 6 the relationship between the insatiable demand for wealth and relative marginal utility and worldly position is another thing again i think we discussed earlier the the relative marginal utility demand for wealth as measured by gold coins is insatiable and the marginal utility increases with more consumptions as measured by the possession of each unit of wealth the need of man are unlimited and they cannot be satisfied except by means of the wealth worldly possession protects wealth and retains it therefore possession is also desired to an unlimited extent one who possesses a worldly possession possesses wealth not vice versa this is something that actually yeah previously he talked about you know something but here he talks about the other side the other aspect which is actually you know you should also have a way of um, systemizing your money how do you control your money how do you distribute your money you should have that you should have that kind of positions that you can hold and then because the position that you are holding can actually safeguard uh, your money you know he also says that one who possesses a worldly position possesses a wealth not vice versa someone is actually have so many wealth not necessarily he has to uh, possess the worldly position so worldly position for example if you are a, if you are a, a leader or you are you are a khalifa for example then actually you know you can actually uh, guide and control people's wealth that's a sub that, that that is what here this is where actually he talks about the politics uh, there must be political economy must be there right uh, the restriction the administration the management that he talks about it yeah number 7 a practical exposition dealing with uh, parsimonious or hoarding inclination what are the practical uh, explanation he talks about the five ways that he suggested keep oneself in the company of the needy and stay away from the rich safeguard one's environment this is what the most important thing this is what we don't want to do 
we always want to stay with the wealthy person and then we want we are thinking that okay i, I should become like him or i should be uh, i should be um, attracted by him or i should be influenced by him you know but the truth is uh, this is also what prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said look when it comes to world material look always below you so that you can you can become shukur you look at someone who doesn't have so that you at least realize that how much you have so that you become shukur to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you appreciate allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so keep oneself in the company of the needy and stay away from the rich indulge in spending of wealth but in generosity not in self interest you spend money no problem but make sure that you don't spend on you you spend on so many other things undertake actions against the inclination to hoard build a healthy and commendable reputation undertake to be consistently reminded by others number 8 policy prescription for a basic strategy on poverty eradication the effectiveness of poverty eradication has often relied on what is felt to be well structured poverty eradication so here he talks about you know he says that the most important uh, policy that we should think when it comes to poverty eradication it is not only the poverty eradication through the physical deficiency because you may uh, try to uh, attempt and you may try to um solve the uh, physical deficiency but what if someone has a mental and psychological and the spiritual deficiency remember this is what exactly imam ghazali said al ghazali said when he talk about kitab al faqr the book of the chapter of uh, poverty he says this the real poverty is not in this world in the material world the real poverty is something that he also mentally and psychologically and spiritually uh you know he, he he is not complete in fact when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ask manil muflis uh, remember prophet ask his uh, companions do you know who is the poor the companion said ya allah ya rasulullah the poor is the one who doesn't have a food doesn't have a dress doesn't have a place to stay prophet said no he is not a poor do you know who is the real poor in the day of judgment someone will come a lots and lots of rewards i mean lots and lots of amal uh, good deeds and then he will bring and the prophet said his good deeds will look like a mountain it's like a himalayas yeah everest so when he reach allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you know for getting the reward which is a paradise then someone will come and tell allah ya allah this man actually uh, cheated me this one man actually blamed me this man actually did this did that so allah subhanahu wa taala will tell okay you have to give your deeds to this man because otherwise i will not give you the paradise so he will keep on giving his good deed his prayers his fasting his hajj his umrah everything including his sadaqa everything he will give for everybody okay he actually came he said oh everybody will come will come and then the list goes on the man who brought the himalayas and the end he will not have anything kosong empty but the list goes on the people still coming the malaika will tell allah subhanahu wa taala the malaika say ya allah this man has lost all his good deeds but still the list continues the people still on the line the people say that still this man actually has done something wrong to these people then allah will say no problem take these people's sins the people who are coming here to complain take those people's sins and put it in his plate <laughs> put it in his account so now this man who came with himalayas with the mountains of the deeds now this guy is actually having and getting the sins because this man is actually cheated blamed steal is all about hukukun nas is all about hukuk is all about people not about allah that's why we have to be very very careful if i don't pray if i don't fast it is between me and allah subhanahu wa taala 
if i don't do shirk allah subhanahu wa taala is uh, is ready he is actually ready to forgive after some punishment he will will forgive me of course the punishments are there because i didn't pray and i didn't do fasting the punishment of the, but after the punishment allah will take me to his paradise but if i have done something wrong to my fellow citizens my fellow friends my own people then allah cannot forgive me allah will not forgive me until these people forgive me so that is the real poverty that imam razi talks about however it is meaningless if the true problem of poverty uh, reflected not only through the physical deficiency but also the mental psychological and spiritual deficiency and number 9 he talks about wealth between the necessity to send to, sorry to spend and the necessity to keep how much you have to keep how much you have to spend nicely done he said two things stinginess means what stinginess means if wealth is kept when it is necessary to spend it so whenever it is necessary and you are keeping it which means it is stinginess and what is extravagance the opposite one is miserliness stinginess the other one is extravagance israf you know what is israf if wealth is spent when it is necessary to keep when it is necessary to keep and you are started sending it spending it then it becomes israf and then you have the factors that can be influence wealth expenditure analysis so here he talks about you know um uh the, the the who is the critic of certain spending of wealth from the wealthy or the poor these are the questions that you know creating the factors who are the beneficiaries from the wealth spent what are the items of expenditure are they necessary are they necessities such as food or wealth? otherwise during which time period was wealth spent in so these are the questions that should be asked in order to understand you know this this will remind this will create the the rightful reason the purpose is that why we are actually spending our wealth then lastly we need to understand these two things types of need not all the time it is a corporeal corporeal is actually our you know our our body our corpus our you know necessities you know like our food drink clothing dwelling you know these are the things corporeal needs but remember we also have the spiritual need the knowledge sought and needed by man however this effort in searching will need more and better food drink clothing and other material so we need to understand these types of needs this is what actually uh, the economic aspect that actually uh, fakhruddin razi he describes in his book kitab an nafs war ruh okay so that's all from me so if you have any questions sir, please go ahead Sir, can I ask about a Simon sir? Uh, 